It's the Fulhamish podcast, your independent voice of Fulham FC. My name's Sammy James. Welcome to the show. Today, we are going to be looking back and doing the final word on our victory at Crystal Palace. A lovely 2-0 victory in a London derby. And we're going to be chatting generally about Fulham's very impressive form. Can we can we kick on from here? Europe winning the league, <laughs> Champions League next season. I guess it's all possible, especially if you listen to Sunday's podcast. Also, I've got a stack full of emails to go through in today's show on a wide variety of topics. Plus, we'll look ahead to some of the international matches that Fulham players will be playing in in the coming week or so. I'm joined on the Thursday Club today by Jack Collins. Hello. Hello, Sammy. How you doing? Good, thank you. And I can get my words out. Um it's yeah. easier said than done, mate. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a difficult task, hosting shows. I know. It is. Lots of words in order. Um, you know, a lot a lots to be expected of me. Probably probably going to be ruling me out of the match of the day gig. Yeah. With intros like yeah, that, yeah, isn't yeah. it? I think your, your odds have just doubled. Damn it. Now 250,000 to one. <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we do that again? Can we do <laughs> no, a no, re- no, no, no. You can, live TV, mate. Live TV. <sighs> this is how Man. it works. I really wanted that game. Matters Day Famous isn't live, but you know, we are where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, yes it is. It's not. Yeah, it is. It's not. I promise you. I'll I, I bet you a million pounds. It goes out twice. How could it be live twice? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Sunday morning isn't live, thank you very much. I don't think I've ever watched it on a Saturday night. I don't think I've ever been in my house at 10.30pm on a Saturday night. Oh, see, I'm a bit of a loser, so I definitely, <laughs> I definitely have. I fell asleep in front of it, actually, on Saturday night. I often come back and watch it once I get in yeah. and fall asleep in front of it, as you say, and then watch it again on, on Sunday I morning. managed to watch uh, the City. I think it started late on Saturday, so I managed to catch City Bournemouth and I think um, City Brighton, sorry, uh, and uh, some of the other matches. But yeah, Fulham Palace. You were well asleep by the time Fulham beat Palace. Fulham Palace, I went all the way through and suddenly I woke up and it was West Ham nil, Everton nil. I was like, ah. Oh. Damn it. First time that either Fulham or Palace haven't been last on match of the day, so that's good. And this I is the it. last of the match of the day derby. Yeah, of course. Who forgot? Who could forget? And it was actually an interesting match on Saturday, Jack. A particularly joyful one uh, in the away end at Selhurst. You were there. I was there. It was just one of those fun days out, you know, wasn't it? Like, Fulham were pretty perfect. I know we've got a couple of slight concerns that we'll come on to later, but you can't ask for too much more. Yeah, I mean, watching it live and, you know, caveat that I, I was quite hungover at the time. I didn't think we were brilliant. I just thought that Palace were incredibly poor. And you kind of look back at it later and you're like, ah, Fulham actually much better than I kind of realised at the time. And it's quite interesting. Obviously, the the feeling is often to be like, oh, when are we going to mess this up, right? Fulhamish. And and given that Palace, you saw that lineup. you saw Devani in the middle, who I thought did quite well for, from a Palace perspective. Is that how you say his name? Devani, yeah. Oh, I thought it was Devani. He's northern. Oh, you could be right. You could be right. Oh, okay. Uh, just mark that and start again. Obviously, you look at that Palace lineup and Devenny's in the middle. They've got either Mark Gahey or Trevor Chalobah playing defensive midfield. You're kind of looking at it going, well, if we don't beat this lot, if we don't beat this mob. I thought Devenny did quite well, to be perfectly he honest, did. in the middle. I thought he was one of their better players. Got an players. international call up off the back of it. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's Palace's under 21's captain. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's also been Northern Ireland's under 21's captain for some time, but I'm not 100%. Convinced on that, I haven't been keeping too close an eye on him. So I'm not hugely surprised that he, he's made that jump into the into the first team. But I thought he was good. But you still look at that lineup, you look at what it's got, and you think, well, if Fulham don't win this game, then you can kind of kiss all those ambitions goodbye. And actually, it's interesting listening to Sunday's podcast. And look, I think we should take some of those comments with a with a hefty pinch of salt. I don't think Fulham are winning the league. Let's be very clear. And I think it would be a stretch, a serious stretch, even with it going down to fifth for Fulham to, to challenge for a Champions League spot. But I do think that that competition for maybe seventh can be on. Now, the Premier League is incredibly tight. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's four points between Chelsea in third and Manchester United in 13th. Yes. Which means that there's a lot of moving and shaking to be done here. And whilst we can be joyful about what's happening and where Fulham are in the table and the way that we're performing, I think generally, it's also probably worth noting that Fulham, I think, are three points behind where we should be at this point in the season. Now, I actually think we dropped two points against both Everton and against West West Ham. Ham. But I also think our point against Ipswich was undeserved. So I'm going to say three points in front of of where we probably should be right now. 
And I think those are the kind of games against really poor teams, obviously one at home, one away, that if you're going to push on and be that seventh club and get into Europe, you really need to go and win. You need to go and win those games. They're the ones that are going to be different. And you see the likes of Brighton, obviously, beating Manchester City at the weekend. They gave Liverpool a very good run the week before at Anfield. And I think we're unlucky not to get something out of that. There's a couple of teams coming. And I imagine that with Amorim coming in at Manchester United, they're going to make a move up the table. I'm a big advocate of his and, and a big proponent of, of him doing well. So I, I'd be very surprised if United don't improve. And I think once all of those things start to kick in, Newcastle now improving as well, it's going to be very, very difficult for, to secure a, a European spot if you're not one of the kind of super clubs at this point. And so whilst I think it's absolutely fair enough and we should be really pleased with the performance, and we can come back to the game now in a sec, with what we did against Palace, with what happened against Brentford, an incredible week for Fulham. We can be really pleased where we are on the table. I'm still a little bit wary that we're probably slightly behind where we should be if we're actually going to push on and try and challenge for that seventh spot. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm still not really getting ahead of myself. I've always kind of thought this season that still top half should be Fulham's aim and anything above that is a bonus. And to be honest, these things like getting into the final conference... We'll make, spots, a pump, make a pump for eighth and assume that the British teams do well enough that actually it drops down to eighth in the yeah. league next year. That, but also, that's like, the play. That, run, that race is in March and April and May. That's when those places... And we famously go to the beach. Yeah, I season. think if we can avoid this season doing that, and who knows what the situation is going to be. If we do make a bit of a cup run, maybe that might take the priority over getting into Europe. And I think if you... If you offered me kind of semi-final or final and Fulham really prioritising that or getting into the Conference League, I think I'd probably be saying, no, let's go all nah, in. Take on... me to Romania, mate. <laughs> Just take me to Wembley. That's all I that's all you I want. You want to go to Wembley, I want to go to Romania. We are not the same. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, we go to Wembley twice and win it. And then we also get to go to Romania, which is uh, which is the absolute dream. I think the only thing for me on Saturday, and it's still a kind of repetitive problem of Fulham, is that I still don't feel like we are creating a huge amount of opportunities. And for me on Saturday, the red card came at a perfect time for us. And look, you can only play what's in front of you. Yeah. And I do actually think for what it's worth that I think Fulham would have seen out the win on Saturday, but I think it would have been nervy. I think there would have been heart in mouth moments and I think for Fulham to really reach that level we, we obviously cannot rely on opposition players doing something absolutely stupid every single week and I still think for me there's something where I'm like we haven't quite solved the creating lots of chances now we did miss some good opportunities against Palace that should have been finished so maybe it was a bit more of a finishing problem than it has been in recent weeks but still there was lots of Beautiful, intricate build-up, some outstanding stuff on both flanks and in the middle of the park and so many forays forward, but still scant few they should definitely score. I'm feeling like Pereira in the second half when he smacked Jordan, uh, De not Jordan Henderson, Dean Henderson in the head uh, with his with his shot was a, probably a guilt-edged chance, but it wasn't, it wasn't loads. And that's still my concern about this Fulham team going forward. I mean, we did put the ball in the back of the net four times. Um, so, so there's that to consider, yeah. I think, at this point. So actually, I thought weirdly on, on Saturday, our chances we took with slightly better aplomb. One exception to this rule is Reese Nelson, who I'm really like in this team and I'm really enjoying watching. I think the link up there between him and Smith Rowe and Awobi, those three Arsenal boys behind the striker, is really working at the moment. And I think that they offer different things in different areas and that Reese Nelson is slightly more dynamic, I think, in those areas and quick footed than maybe Adama has been in, in the season gone, gone by. And actually, that's what I quite like about him, is that there is that sense of intricacy that he can use with Smithrow and, and dive into those areas that feels like it's you know showing us big opportunities. Nelson is snatching at his shots at the moment. And I wonder if that is just a case of him being like, I really want to, you know, obviously he's off the mark in the league, but he's now in the starting lineup for the first time. And I think he's really desperate to stay there. So I think that there is an element of when he gets these chances, he's rushing. And we saw a couple pulled tight, you know, to of the left-hand post when he's cutting inside from when he was against Brentford. And he, he's a little bit unlucky um, in this game not to score. But those opportunities have to start being taken because that's where we're finding joy. And if that's a repetitive process, I'm pleased with that because attacking patterns are a good thing. Yeah. And if we can start to utilise that a bit better and start to put those away then that's a good sign. But I did think we were slightly more clinical. I mean, 
the Pereira chance is is frustrating because I don't know. I mean, he just gets to the end of it and hits it. And to be honest, Dean Henderson's face is just there. It's, it's not like he makes a brilliant save. It just sort of hits him. And look, maybe there's time for him to be a bit calm, Andreas, and, and, and slot it. But I think that opportunity opens up in such quick time that he just like gets something on it and will probably beat the keeper from this range. Yeah. And so it's a frustrating one from that regard, I think. I still don't see it as a finishing problem, though. I still think it is chance, like really good clear cut chance creation. Maybe. I, I mean, like offs- how many? I mean, obviously, uh, uh, offside goal is an offside goal. So, so that's. Sure. But like, it's the offside goal is incredibly tight. Yes, it's offside. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it isn't. But like, there's one of those things where if he checks his run slightly, that's an incredibly well worked opportunity from Alex Awobi, who does brilliantly to put that yeah. ball in. And the Harry Wilson one that he handballs is frustrating. They're down, the same... they're down, down to 10 by the Fine. Okay. But, so, um... you know, we you have to take what you're getting. And, and to be honest, Brentford may as well have been down to 10 when we played them on Monday yeah. and we couldn't carve out opportunities. So actually, I was more pleased with that element of the game than perhaps with other bits of it. I thought there were some nice moments. I thought that we looked tight and intricate in those areas. Yes. Okay. We're not blowing teams away at this point. But you said this a couple of weeks ago and I think you're probably right. It does feel like someone is going to get blitzed yes. because Fulham just have that ability to pen you in your half and stop you getting out that we've seen now in the last two games. And when we do that, there is, there is going to be a game where that just completely opens up. Well, and also like very, very rarely away from home. Do you ever go and blitz a team? I think like had that match been at Craven cottage on Saturday, I could have seen Fulham winning three or four or five but ultimately like at Selhurst Park you just get the job done two nil happy days three points three points get out exactly exactly so it was it was a very good performance and I don't know from your point of view where do you see things going because now the run of games is 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 Wolves it's then Spurs it's then Brighton it's then Arsenal uh, I think Liverpool after that so it's it's five you know, Wolves being the exception, five very, very tough games. I, I, I Fulham are not going to win all five, anything close to that for me. And that's why all of this chat about Europe and the league and all of this, I think we can all calm down a little bit. But I can see us winning two, maybe even three of those. Like, I don't think it's impossible. No, I, I think that what's interesting about this iteration of Fulham is that it doesn't really feel like anyone is going to come and absolutely wipe the floor with us. Now, there might be results that you lose 3-0 and maybe that's the Liverpool game. You know, it's a tricky one and obviously up at Anfield, they've been absolutely brilliant and and look, they lead the league. So they have the ability to tear almost anybody apart. But it doesn't feel like Fulham are going to go there with any fear. And and I really like that about this sense of, of Marcus Silva's team. You watch some of the teams further down the bottom of this table and they really do feel like they're going places with sort of no real belief that they're going to go and do things. There is exceptions to this rule. Ipswich, I think, you know, have been really punchy when they've gone anywhere. But actually up to this weekend, it's kind of felt like Wolves have had doom hanging over them, sort of Damocles kind of stuff, that every time something goes wrong, it's going to go wrong with Wolves. And I think even someone like Brentford, who obviously aren't that far off us in terms of where we are in the league table and, you know, where the two clubs are at right now, they just feel a sense that they're going to go and do things differently away from home. That doesn't really feel like it's the case with Fulham. And actually with players coming back into the side, with Harry Wilson forcing a case for himself off the bench once again, with Sasha Lukic now about to return after this international break, we hope and we think, like there comes a question of how do you fit everybody in? It's a great problem to have. It's still a problem. And I think that when we look at what's going on here, whether that is playing Sander Berger and Sasa Lukic in there together and how that impacts us going forward or if that makes us more defensively solid in a game, you know, like we played against Manchester City where Smith Rowe actually drops out despite being brilliant at the weekend in order to just make sure that we are just a little bit harder to beat in there. We saw that, you know, very nearly work and probably should have worked against Manchester City. I do find it interesting to see how Marcus Silva will deal with this period. But I think that some bigger tests are exactly what we need right now. And look, you could be right. We could lose four of these five games. I don't think we will, but it's it's very like within the realms of possibility. I don't think that that would be, it wouldn't be ridiculous if Fulham lost to Spurs, Brighton, Arsenal and Liverpool. And I don't think anyone would be like, oh, we're, we're now rubbish. 
But I think it's important to get these tests in because it gives us a proper barometer of actually where we are rather than playing a Brentford side who refused to play football and a Palace side who were so depleted that it almost made them kind of unable to to stand up and face us. Yeah, I mean, the league's interesting this year. The league, to me, resembles a bit of the 21-22 season where obviously the World Cup fell in the middle and the top sides playing in Europe basically had to play every single midweek and that's obviously a consequence of the the new Europa and Champions League. It just feels like there's a lot more shocks happening and that's also partially down to the quality of the Premier League. I saw someone do a tweet saying, you know, all this talk of prime Barclays but Brighton, Bournemouth, Fulham and Forest shit all over some of the old kind of mid-table teams that used to be in this oh, league. 100%. And I think it's... It, the quality it, of football has gone up. Like, people might not enjoy it as much, and that's fine. That's a subjective decision that you can make. But you can't tell me that the quality of football hasn't gone up. It has. Of course it has. Yeah, and right now the league feels super competitive, and there feels like, actually, the cutoff point now is like... Uh, don't give me a big six or a big four. It's like a big 13 now, isn't it? Like, Well, I think there are obviously layers within that. I think yeah. the, the top three feel still oh, maybe not streets ahead because I think Chelsea are working their way back into that equation, sadly. But I feel like there there is a, a gap between the Champions League calibre sides. But then and they're playing else. so many games yeah. that they can trip up at any time now because they're just all tired. And I mean, the amount of injuries that Arsenal have got, that City have got, Liverpool have managed to keep a okay bill of health, but still, like, they're, they're only... Yeah, like, Alisson and Jota are still out. Right? Yeah. They're just coping with it better, I think, is, is, is the truth of it. And it feels like, you know, teams like Fulham and Bournemouth and Brighton not playing many games, long time between fixtures, lots of recovery time, lots of time to plan... I guess like it will get a bit tougher now in December. Now there but are but also more games. just money, money, right? Yeah. Like Bournemouth have Evan Nielsen starting up front. Evan Nielsen scored like five goals in the Champions League last year for Porto. Like he's a really, really talented footballer, and you know was someone that we were talking about you know a year ago in terms of transfers. When on ranks, we were talking about him potentially being an answer for Man United or something. He's ended up at Bournemouth, and that's not a slight on Bournemouth. I think it's a brilliant signing, and I think they're doing a really good job. And I love Iriola, but. Like the fact is that when there is that kind of quality, you look at mid- Wolves' is midfield three, and Wolves are what in the relegation zone, and you're looking at that going, yeah, they're all really, really good players. They are very talented. Lamine has been excellent for a while. Uh, Joao Gomes, I thought, was the second best tackler in the division behind Joao Polina last year. And Andre, I still think, is a, a wonderful footballer, and I maintain that it is going to have a long career at, at top level. So you're kind of looking at that and saying, well, if that's the midfield of a team that are, you know, scrapping for their lives at the bottom, then obviously the quality is so much higher than it has been, I think, across the division. And this does feel like three, even Southampton, who have their own way of playing and I think probably will go down. Even they are going and giving teams real games. And I think it's interesting watching the dynamics of the league work this year because it does feel like kind of a weird place in terms of, not everyone beating everyone. I think that's probably a stretch. Mm. But in terms of those results where I think, uh, you know, a Southampton beating a, a Crystal Palace last year, that kind of felt a little bit all over the place. Like you weren't seeing a Luton rock up a Glasner's Palace and win. Whereas this year, I think you can you could imagine Southampton going and beating a Palace or, you know, Southampton going and beating a Brentford. And I think that probably applies to us as well in that category. But at the moment, we just seem to be seeing those challenges off. And I think that's impressive. But you go back to the Ipswich game. And again, I don't think we deserve to win that game. So the the competitiveness of the league is definitely there. And I think that we're going to be in that middle pack punching upwards. And it's a nice place to be, I think, at this point. Yeah, uh, there are 10 uh, kind of first team players going away on international duty. Uh, Harry Wilson um, is uh, in action. Four games in six for club and country, Harry. Yeah. Great stuff. Uh, lots of goals, please, Harry. He's playing uh, Turkey and Iceland. Pereira's uh, going to be representing Brazil. Obviously, you've got Awobi and Bassi off for Nigeria. Sanderberg uh, playing uh, a couple of games for Norway. Uh, Jochem Anderson, Timothy Castagna, and obviously uh, Robinson and Jimenez off to, uh, off, off to CONCACAF. Um, I mean, last time it felt like the international break in fact i think all the international breaks have felt like they've been a bit of a momentum killer for fulham we haven't won any of the games after Apparently the international after. break with the anti spurs spurs <laughs> can't win a game before an international break we can't win one afterwards yeah but i mean that wolves game and we'll preview it more next week but um feels like a really great opportunity to uh to hit three in a row 
Yeah, I, I think so. Look, Wolves have improved over the last couple of weeks, and obviously they got their first win at the weekend, and deservedly so. Although Saints, again, gave them a game, and it was uh, quite a competitive one. I think that we can probably physically outmatch Wolves. And the fact that they don't have any depth in their defensive areas, they've been left short in those spaces. And I think that, you know, one or two more injuries and Wolves are in real trouble because just they've started to find, a, you know, claw themselves back into the game and into contention and trying to pull themselves clear. I do think they've got to a point where you're like, oh, you are on the precipice, you lose another defender and you are just absolutely screwed in there. There's no one else mm -hmm. that can step into these roles. Now, Gary O'Neill has got some flack this season for not being particularly adaptable with his formations or his football. And I think deservedly so, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I think that whilst he's been a little bit unlucky in terms of the, the fixtures they've had, they, there is also an element of being like, you have to change something. Doing the same thing over and over again is the definition of madness, right? Mm -hmm. Expecting different results. So... I think that it's a really nice opportunity this for Fulham, especially given you know where it is and the fact that we we get to do this at home. All of that matters in terms of dialing into it, and I think if we can get the the place lifted again, people aren't coming back from the international break like tired or fatigued. Then there's a real opportunity for Fulham to go and kick on again, and especially before that difficult run to put ourselves in a nice, comfortable place. So that even it, once those tricky fixtures arrive, Fulham are playing them with no pressure on us, no fear on us, and then able to go out and and give those kind of games that we've seen us give almost everyone this season to teams who are, you know, Liverpool aside. I think you go to you talk about Spurs and you talk about Arsenal, both of them rocking a little bit in terms of where their campaigns are and where they expect to be. I think that Fulham are the kind of side that might be able to exploit those weaknesses because any sort of early pressure, early kind of momentum from Fulham is going to wind the crowd up. And that's probably a good thing in this idea. Yeah, 100 percent. All right. Uh, we will take a break there. Afterwards, uh, we'll dive into some of your emails. This episode of Fulhamish is brought to you by NordVPN. NordVPN is a way of watching sporting matches from all around the world just by changing the location on your tablet, your laptop or your phone. For instance, you can use NordVPN to watch football matches for a fraction of the cost, including those 3 p.m. fixtures that aren't available here in the UK. Plus, you can use NordVPN on up to 10 devices. So, for instance, if my dad goes on holiday to Spain, he can log in using my account and then he can watch Match of the Day to catch up on those Fulham highlights. Only when Fulham win, of course. Right now, you can get a great deal by signing up for NordVPN at nordvpn.com slash Fulhamish. Not only will you get a great rate, but you'll get four months extra as well. Plus, it's completely risk-free thanks to NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. So to get that great rate plus four extra months, go to nordvpn.com slash Fulhamish. That's nordvpn.com slash Fulhamish. Part two of the Fulhamish podcast. It is Sammy here with Jack Collins. Uh, let's dive into some of your emails. First one from David Jones. Uh, Hi, Fulhamish. Just in case you missed it, our own Alex Awobi is giving music a shot. Big what 17. Do we, what do we think? I'm gassed. I like his single. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what he has. I, I love it when footballers have stuff on the side. There was a striker who played for Brighton a few years back. I've just completely forgotten his name. Um, but he had a separate music career going on at the same time. Obviously, well. Erling Haaland has one. <laughs> Erling Haaland's one is, is slightly slightly different. But like, I genuinely think that Alex Iwobi's single or the, the bits of it, the kind of snippets of it that have been released, I've been like, yeah, it sounds quite good. I've heard him freestyle them before. He's pretty good. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm gas for words. I'm glad that he's got a hobby on the side. He's not, you know, sitting around doing nothing in the evenings, twiddling his thumbs. I'm well, he's also words. busy on Photoshop. The last two games he's had, uh, he put um, uh, uh, Harry Wilson, made him a prince, a Nigerian prince. Yeah, great stuff. And then uh, put some abs on Emil Smith-Rowe because he keeps doing uppers in the gym because he blames uh, Smith-Rowe's puffed chest as the For, reason. Uh, the reason he was offside. He was yeah. the reason he was offside against uh, Palace. That's so. three assists, if I'm not mistaken, this season that wobi has been robbed of. Ooh, yes. It's not great for my prediction. No, that is bad for your prediction. Yeah. What? So, yeah. Did um, you say double figures? I think I said double figures for goals and assists, yeah. Yeah, that needs to get upped. Lovely assists, though, for Harry Great Wilson's assist. goal. Great assist. Great assist for both of the goals, even if one of them was disallowed. The ball yeah. across for Smith-Rowe is exceptional as well. So 
I thought Awobi was absolutely sensational on Saturday. Yes. I thought he was our best player by a mile. And I know a lot of the love has gone to Emil Smith Rowe because he did some nice things and he scored a goal. But for me, what Awobi does, what he brings to his team, and you know, he's been switched out to the other wing now to to get Nelson in there. He just takes it all in his stride and everything he does, he's just so composed on the ball. Again, I don't think I've ever seen him lose it. No, he doesn't. Like, lose he just it. doesn't lose the ball, and the way that he brings others into play in those attacking areas. If you've got one player on the edge of the box, you know you get to that kind of Martin Erdegaard thing from the Chelsea game, where you're like, which Fulham player do you want in that position? The answer is Alex Awobi every single time. He's just like he's a, become a leader in this camp in his own way. He's not had to like soften or change his personality. I think people really like being around him. But on the pitch, he delivers week on week on week. I, I absolutely adore Alex Wobey. I see him a little bit as our Willian um, replacement in terms of being experienced. Willian never gave the ball away, really, or certainly rarely did. Yeah. Um, again, in a pressure moment, it's probably it was Willian that you wanted to be doing that Trying final to pick pass the lock. or pick yeah. the lock. And I think Awobi has taken on that mantle. And I think um, I think Silva quite likes the the idea of having a winger like Alex Awobi, who is not like rapid, rapid pace, although he's not slow, um, who can control the ball, who can bring the fullback into play, and then just having a beast on the other side, like a Nelson or a Triore. Yeah, like someone who's, who's going to you know, stretch the play and either get in behind or, or hug the touchline. I agree. I think that he wants one of his wingers to be sort of an interior player, yeah. and that is Awobi at the moment, because I also think it allows him, and I've said it before, to dovetail with Smith Rowe, and at times when Emil Smith Rowe will pull wide, or Andreas, who often does this as well, and we talked about this combination last year with with Andreas and and, and Awobi, that Andreas would often drift out to the right hand side to try and deliver crosses into the box, whilst Awobi is in those kind of central areas. And I, I think he's just such an intelligent footballer um, from kind of top to bottom. When he he works incredibly hard, his carrying of the ball is incredible. No one can knock him off the ball. But also his delivery and his decision making in the final third, I think, is exceptional. So yeah, shout out to Wobby. Um, what a guy! And yeah, now in the music scene as well, I'm sure he'll make excellent decisions there as well. <laughs> uh, next one from uh, Harrison Doyle. Uh, hello, Fulhamish, long time listener, long time emailer, and evergreen Pereira supporters. Haters can hate. Just sharing a small funny story. Having listened to the uh, the Thursday Club a few weeks ago, a fan named Jamie wrote in to let us know that there are in fact Fulham and Fulhamish fans out in Fiji. Yes, um, Jamie said uh, he became a Fulham fan because he is a Kiwi who didn't have a Premier League club, and so that he decided to support Fulham because Simon Elliott was on the team. Pretty niche to have a Simon Elliott story but back in 2011 when I was playing soccer for my university my coach invited Simon Elliott to train with us. Simon had just left Shivas USA and was a free agent trying to keep in shape. After training I grabbed a marker from one of our team physios took boots off and asked Simon Elliott if he would sign my boots and let me be clear I was very much alone in doing this <laughs> Simon was a super nice guy and said he was happy to as Simon was signing my boots I told him it was a dream of mine to train with a former Fulham player having supported Fulham since 1992 in response to that statement Simon said incredulously funny that's why you want me to sign these and laugh apparently not as many people remember those potent Fulham appearances as well as others anyway respect out there for all the Simon Elliott fans shoes so big only a guy like Alexi Smirton could fill them that's cheers from Harrison in Santa Barbara <laughs> that's amazing that's absolutely incredible this is becoming the Simon Elliott podcast and I am absolutely here for it Simon Elliott is all of our heroes and yeah I'm, I'm let's any try and get Simon Elliott on the pod yeah, we've we've it's been a while since we've had a big interview. Yeah, that would be a big one. Maybe the biggest, <laughs> actually, considering where we're at. Let's get Simon Elliott on the pod. Any more Simon Elliott stories, please send them yeah, in. Yeah, please send them in. Any please do. any rare and close encounters with, with, with the brilliant Simon Elliott, please. Phenomenal. Uh this one from Patricia says, Dear Fulhamish, I'm writing as one of the many, I'm sure, Arsenal fans who are now Fulham followers thanks to your great club buying our boy Emil Smith-Rowe and giving him a chance to show what he can do. I'm thoroughly enjoying being a Fulham fan, love the podcast and can now recognise nearly the whole team. 
It's also great to see Awobi has not changed one bit since his time at Everton and Arsenal. He is so Awobi-ish. Anyway, I was listening to the Monday Night's Monday Night Lights podcast and was interested to hear the bit about who should take corners. Until relatively recently, Arsenal were total rubbish at corners. Even players like Fabregas were useless. It was so bad, whenever we got a corner, people would say, oh, it's only a corner, nothing going to happen. Then in that season, 2021, I think when Emil Smith-Rowe began to get playing regularly something did happen he started taking corners on the left and stacker started taking them on the right and it was really obvious that finally there was some good practicing going on they were both really good so i would say yes give emil smith row a go he is technically excellent but is too modest to push himself forward so someone at fulham needs to do it woby will do it <laughs> woby will put him forward for anything um while i'm here one thing i haven't grasped about fulham is adama triare that guy is so good so strong so fast but why on earth has he not been taught to finish he should do nothing else in training but practice finishing what a waste from patsy welcome to the club patsy um welcome to the club it's great to have you here um expect more of the same uh we've said it before but uh, if adama could finish he wouldn't be a fulham he yes. would be starting still at barcelona you'd imagine so yeah um yeah, we're we're enjoying having Emma Smith Rowe here as well. So it, it's it's a good time. There's a lot of there's a lot of an Arsenal Fulham loving at the moment. It's it might really... well end when Emil Smith Rowe scores the winner against Arsenal in a couple of weeks. But it's uh, going to be now, a very interesting match, that isn't it? The the narratives in the week beforehand are going to get a bit uh... Arsenal versus Halen Juniors. Yeah, <laughs> like, it does feel there's going to be a, a lot. Like there's going to be a lot of content. It feels like Nelson won't not... be able to play. Yes, interesting point. Well, we've got enough cover. Yeah. In comes Adama. Yeah. It'll be the one game he can still finish in. Yeah, sorry, then, Patsy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when Adama gets a hat-trick against Arsenal, we're all loving it. I do find... I mean, it's obviously a great sign of how loved, particularly Smith Rowe was. I think there's a lot of love for Iwobi too, but Smith Rowe seemed like someone I think so, all, so special. None of the well. Arsenal boys who were here left Arsenal on particularly poor terms. Yeah. So Bernd Leno didn't. He was just forced out by you know the introduction of Aaron Ramsdale at that time because he wasn't good enough with his feet, which is somewhat ironic in some ways, but yeah. it is what it is. Um, so there was never any bad blood there. There was never any bad blood with Smith Rowe, who, you know, obviously was just... But it's not, it's not just even bad blood. They, they are actively, like, they follow... You know, you watch every Fulham video on YouTube in terms of, like, the official highlights they put on Sky, and, and most of the comments are Arsenal fans here for Smith Rowe. Yeah. I mean... I think it's kind of similar, though, to how at least I felt when Sass left. Like having someone that had come up through the academy and really felt like ours and our star boy go. Like I would follow Spurs games and be delighted for Seth every time he did something well for years until he came back. Yeah. And so like I totally relate to that feeling. No, 100%. It's quite annoying not being able to do that for Fabio Carvalho. I was quite pleased when he was knocking around at Liverpool doing well. Um now I can get out. Yeah. Now I can get out. So, so yeah. No, I, I think it's fair. And, and But I do think that because if it was just Smith Rowe here, I think there would be a, an interest from Arsenal fans, of course. But I think that because he's moved here and then also Nelson's here and then also Burn Leno's here and also oh, wow. Alex Awobi is here. And now Willian's gone. Yeah. I, I, I just feel like there's probably this kind of sense that, you know, this, this Fulham team... I mean, on paper, considering where we are in the league, it's probably like a, a bit of a misnomer. But on paper, weren't it wasn't like they'd moved to a Chelsea, for example, yeah. right? It's a team that are probably not going to trouble. And I say that in, in inverted commas, in terms of actually being there and competing, Arsenal's title bid. I mean, obviously, Fulham's win over Arsenal last year was one of the things that you know helped to derail it. So it is quite interesting seeing what happens in that game, as you say. But there does feel like an inordinate amount of love for Smithrow. And, and look, I think that's something we can ride. The only problem I have with it at times is that sometimes that narrative sort of overshadows everything else. It was a bit like Smithrow was good, really good at the weekend and he deserves props, right? But the idea that Awobi's performance was just completely overshadowed by that and all of the headlines were Smithrow, you know, helps Fulham to win. Yeah. There's always goal scorer bias though, isn't there? Yeah, of course. But like even then, you know, there was a there was a thing on I, I read it on BBC Sport a few weeks ago that was like Emil Smith Rowe is at the heart of everything good about Fulham. And I was like, well, he's not. I mean, he, he's very good, but also we were extremely good against Manchester City without him on the pitch. Like, not everything good about Fulham comes from Emil Smith Rowe. And sometimes I feel like that might overshadow the entirety of what how good this team is as a whole. 
that's the only thing I would say. But it doesn't seem to bother the players and who who seem to absolutely love him. So not yeah, fine. that's fine with me. Next email from Robert Coughlin. Uh, quite a short one. This um, hi fellas. I'm going to miss the take me home chant now that the news about our former owner has been outed. Um, what can we do to get it back? All the best from Bob. I don't know, um, but there is definitely a way of rewriting this chant. The only problem with this is that once you rewrite a chant, it never really has the same capacity that it once did. Do you remember the Ryan Frederick song, To Scooter, right? And they tried to rewrite that for Anthony Robinson, and it just was like, nah, you're right. It never really went in the same way that it had done for Fredericks in the first place. Yeah. And I do worry that when you rewrite something, it loses some of the magic of what the original was. That there will be ways to rewrite that. We're not the only team that sing a "Take Me Home." Um, well, most Man United teams, sing it. it they, the, the, most teams that do it. So Oxford have it. Manchester United have it, and it's normally the road that the stadium's on. Yeah. So it's United. Well, it's United Road, I think, for Manchester United. It's London Road randomly for Oxford because that's where their old stadium was before they moved to the Kassam. Um, Take so, me home, Stevenage Road. So you could do Stevenage Road. That's what I've always thought. I mean, Robert's suggesting the shade Khan, but I just really don't. I don't think that's going to cook, but Stevenage Road might go. Yeah. I mean, like all these things, it, it happens organically and it's hard to know exactly when. There is an element, though, that, you know, I used to love singing that chant because of everything else in that song. It was never really, for me, that much about um al fired it's just but you know, well, i did it's, hear, not, it's not right to sing it now obviously i did hear a joe bryan oh which i thought was interesting oh Brentford. right yeah that that went around the back for a little while um which was yeah, ways around it yeah. ways around it i, I don't know, people the the originality of the people will, will conquer as usual but i would be i'll be surprised if take me home dies its complete death i think it will be revisited in some form or another but it's just a question of when that comes yeah. I think it's going to be difficult, though, to do it in a way that doesn't have a mixture of people singing the old chant that obviously, like, I don't want to sing. Yeah. And a new chant in the same way when an opposition team sings a chant, the same tune as one of ours, and we try and drown them out and there's this clash. It doesn't sound right. I think it's going to be like a good matter of years because if someone sings the Fredericks chant by accident, that's fine. If someone sings the Alpha chant by accident, I mean, yeah, people do what fine. you want to do, but that is not for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I, I think it'll, it's going to take some time for these things to, to work themselves out, and, and you're right for them to kind of drop out of existence on where they were. So, yeah, I, I'll be surprised if it doesn't make a reappearance at some point. However, yeah, because it, it was a, a, a it class. Was a, it was a staple. It, it was a staple. It was up there with you know, can't take my eyes off you and all of that for kind of ones that you looked forward to belting out, especially when Fulham were doing well or winning, etc., yeah. etc. By the way, the Fulham fans on Saturday. Great stuff. Really good. I had a great time. It was a really good away end. Yeah. It was absolutely top notch. Uh, this one from uh, Chris Miller uh, says, Hello, Fulhamish team. Obligatory but true. Long time listener. First time emailer. Writing to you lot from Fulham, DC, back in the States. What a cool. two weeks it's been with a couple of big derby victories. I was struck by Kenny Tete suffering another red card foul against Palace and recalled his similar instance that resulted in sendings off for Tariq Mitchell and Zhao Felix in years past. This made me wonder if King Kenny has indeed drawn the most red cards in the last several years. It sure seemed to me that that was the case. I hadn't seen much chatter or data on this, uh, so I had a look myself. As far as FB Ref would let me look at least, and please feel free to double check my record keeping on this. I haven't. By my quickish count, in all competitions since the much maligned 18-19 season, Fulham's opponents have been issued 12 red cards drawn by only five players across the squad. So, um, Dennis Adoy and Joe Bryan each have one. Kenny Tete has drawn three. Mitrovic is level with Kenny, drawing three red cards whilst at Fulham. Thomas Socek, Douglas Louise, and James Tompkins uh, at Crystal Palace. I was surprised to learn that man on fire Harry Wilson is actually the squad leader, drawing four red cards. Three in the championship season when we got promoted. Down off Furlong, Paul Van Hecker and Ryan Manning and Jao Cancelo for Man City. With most of Harry's red card fouls suffered in the championship, it definitely seems like Tete is the current master of this trade in the Prem. Anyway, I hope you all may enjoy this simple deep dive, especially if others were similarly curious. Uh, thanks for all the pods. Cheers from Chris Miller. 
What's interesting about Kenny's one? That's great research. Chris. Thank you. So Chris. Thank you very much for that. What's interesting about Kenny's one for me is that they're all the same tackle. Yes, that's the weird thing. Like about that's it. the that's the bizarre thing about this that all of them seem to be a heavy touch, and he ends up on the end of it. And I don't know if that's just him being clever. He's done something to draw the ire of certain players, but you kind of look at that, and actually, all three of those players aren't the kind of types you're like, you know, they're gonna go and do that. None of it, them, as well, were particularly. And none of them were Roy Keane doing it out of just pure anger. Yeah, tackles. they're all just extra stretches. And I wonder if it's just him being in the right place at the right time to actually take that ball away in those areas. That is anticipation as opposed to anything else, right? Being able to be able to pick out a heavy touch and as they lunge, nip it away from them is actually a, an incredibly difficult skill. Yeah, I wonder if it's something to do with that because Kenny's one-on-one -on -one defending is so good and it has been so often to do with his anticipation, ability to stand people up, ability to wait for the ball to become available and then sort of crab it away. That I wonder if actually he sees those opportunities and goes, yep, that's a ball free in a way just a split second before most others do. Yeah. And that's why I think that this tackle was interesting because again, Kamada, Felix, Tyrick Mitchell, none of them can usually have a reputation for being particularly aggressive footballers. And... I find it intriguing that all three of them have been caught by almost exactly the same thing. I think there's an element, isn't it? I mean, you notice it when you play football with people. Some people have a, an ability to make you think you can tackle them because you think they've got a heavy touch, but actually at the split second, they actually can move their feet so quickly and just tip that ball away from you. And often... I haven't played with you for ages. <laughs> you do not have this ability. Um... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Unnecessary. <laughs> in 22 23, um, I think it was when Kenny was like on absolute fire, the two of the tackles there mentioned were that season. And there was also one from Son that definitely should have been a red card. I'm like, I'm not bitter about it, but it was in January 2023. Um, and I think that is when he was at his point when he was so quick footed. And I think you're right, it comes down to the fact that people are, he's just getting away and it's so easy to slightly mistime those situations because they're all straight reds yeah. yeah 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 and maybe you don't expect it from a right back as well maybe you expect a, a reese nelson that you probably wouldn't lunge in on reese nelson because he's just going to nip that nip ball, away, ball away, from away you. but possibly the right back who isn't known for being like incredibly skillful he actually is way more skillful than I think a lot of people give him credit for. Maybe you just think, oh, I can win that one. It's Kenny Tete. Yeah. And actually, he surprises you at the final moment. I'm sure Xiao Felix... He really quick over like a, a very short period of time. Yeah. Like, and there's something about this, like small burst acceleration that allows them to just move the ball away. And I was talking about Ricky Pooj in MLS about this. But like, it's not necessarily about being fast. It's about having that acceleration to pull away from a player in really short time, spends of time. And actually, in this is the opposite end of it. But I do think that Kenny has that ability to sort of like snap to a ball almost that not as many people have in the same kind of sort of acceleratory pace. Yeah. This one from Matt Wall. Um, I wrote a few weeks ago to ask this question and the answer was no. Um, but he wants an updated answer. Are we safe yet? I'm increasingly looking at the teams around us, above us, rather than at the bottom three and the gap to it. I mean... Obviously, mathematically, no. I must admit that the gap to... I, I, I still, until we get to 35 points, I'm still very much enjoying... For what it's worth, I think we'll be fine. Of course. But, like, I, I just spoke about that kind of gap between 13th and 3rd, right? Yeah. And, actually, if a couple of results don't go away, and as you say, you know, we've got that tricky run coming up at the start of December... If Fulham, I don't know, pick up two points from those four games, even that would be a relatively decent return, I think. But and and drop tumble down the table to sort of twelfth. I think the points gap looks far like less secure than actually the places gap, mm. if you know what I mean. And I do think when you get towards the end of the year, that the amount of bodies in between you and the relegation zone matters. Like the amount of clubs beneath you, because you know not every single one of them is going to pick up points every single week, and therefore you have a little bit of a buffer zone. But with it so tight in those areas, if we were on the same points as we're on now and we were thirteenth, I think we'd all still be a little bit like, Ooh. and that wouldn't necessarily yeah. be that weird considering how the table has panned out. So I think the answer is still no. I'm not worried about it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I don't know why I always remember 
um, the first season under Silver in the Premier League, we beat Forest 2-0 in early February, and that got us to 30 points. And I always feel like when you get above like 10 points, 20 points, 30 points, 40 points, there's always a little bit of a milestone to it. And I remember that was the point where I went, okay, now we're safe. Yeah. Like, I was like, it's February, we're on 30 points. And there was about seven teams beneath us. Yeah, you'd almost have to go on some sort of, like, record-breaking losing Legendary run here losing run, yeah. to even be in the conversation for going down. So that was the point. So I think for me, look, if, if, considering what we're on now, 18, there's, I think, about seven matches in December. If you could get towards 30 points by the end of the year, boy, then you're looking really, then you're looking really tasty. But I still think there's work to be done before anyone can really get too excited. And and I think the other thing is that like it doesn't feel like anyone's going to get cast adrift this year. Maybe that works in our favour. Maybe it ends up with a lot of teams in there in the scrap and actually that kind of helps. Oh, I don't know. Southampton for me. I know that they've... Okay, all right. But it's not like a bottom three are going to get cast adrift. No. It, like, it, it feels like there's going to be this really sort of weird competitive edge down there until sort of... I, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a proper survival Sunday, let's mm. say, this year in the Premier League, which I haven't had for a while. Yeah. So I think that with that in mind, it doesn't feel like any of those teams, or at least maybe one, maybe Southampton, as you say, will get cut trip. But even they, again, have been competitive in games. And you kind of look at that and think, mm, does that make it a little bit more uncomfortable for the teams above them? If they go on a bad losing run, can you get sucked in? I think the answer is still yes. So no, we're not safe, but we should be looking upwards. I agree with Matt. Uh, this one from Brendan Mazar. This might sound like a criticism, but I don't mean it to be. The last few matches, Brentford and Palace, Berg's passing has been tidy but very basic, particularly in the late stages of the Brentford game when we were desperate for an unlocking pass. So the question is, should we assume Marco has instructed Berger to play simple passes and to leave the creativity to our other midfielders and wingers? Is he capable of more if required or is this who he is? He's a recycler, right? And actually the way that Berger breaks lines is often running from deep and we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago when he's in there with Andreas he doesn't really have the freedom to do that I think when he's in there with Sasha Lukic he might because Sasha has a little bit more defensive nous about him in terms of being able to cover if Berger goes on a flying run but what I actually quite like about Berger is that he hasn't done that in the last couple of games he has sat and he has been very very solid and been the like linchpin and the lighthouse in the middle of the park for Fulham to kind of build around. And actually, when he gets the ball, he recycles it and it just goes onwards. That's good. I don't want him hanging onto the ball unless he has the ability to drive, which at the moment in this team and in this setup, he doesn't. So I think that that's very much on purpose. He's not really ever been a particularly incisive passer of the ball. And I think that, you know, we were just talking about who do you want that player on the edge if Fulham are looking for a goal? Well, the answer is fundamentally not Sander Berger. So I think it's probably smart management that he's getting the ball and moving it on rather than looking to play a Hollywood ball, which he doesn't really have in his locker. Yeah. Next one, I say I've got so many emails today from Austin Chung. Uh, Hi, Fulhamish. My name's Austin. I'm responding to your question about Fulham followers from around the world. I uh, thought I'd share my experience. Uh, I grew up in Hong Kong following Fulham right after the 2006 World Cup. I was an American living abroad and quickly joined the Full America fan base. Games were usually around 11 p.m. or later on Saturday night. So whilst out enjoying the nightlife, I'd be able to catch uh, the game out, games out at bars. Um, now I thankfully live in Charleston, South Carolina and can watch it every game at 10 a.m. on Saturdays. Much more enjoyable. Oddly enough, despite the many places I've been, I've never met another Fulham fan in the wild. So this podcast makes me feel part of the Fulham community. My question is actually related to this will catch on. For those of us who have never been to a game, what are your favourite chants that are actually sung? The broadcasts don't pick up anything. So I have no idea what makes the cut. Uh, thanks for everything you do on the podcast from Austin. It's everything we do on this will catch on Austin. You know, they're all they're all there <laughs> in the terraces. Um, no, uh, it's well, one, that's a great story. And, uh, and I love that. I'm, I'm sure there must be another Fulham fan in Charlotte. So make yourself known. Char no, Charleston, North South Carolina. Oh, because Tim Reams in Charlotte. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Charleston. OK, all right. Well, I'm sure there will be another Fulham fan in North Carolina. If, if, uh, South Carolina. Oh, my God. You just said North. <laughs> I said South. You said North. <laughs> Sorry, Austin. I, I'm sending you all over the place. You've been in Charlotte. You've been in the wrong Carolina. Um, right. Someone make yourself known to Austin anyway. If there's one in Fiji, there's going to be one somewhere in South Carolina. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, Favourite chance. I mean, for me, like, it's when... 
you, the ones that are so well known that the whole crowd can get involved like it is fun like i like the new moon is one for for what it's worth but nothing can beat for me like can't take my eyes off of you and often we sing that when we're winning or a goal's just yeah, been scored. Yeah, yeah. We often sing that in good moments in games. So. I deeply enjoyed Harry Wilson. He's done it again at the weekend. Yes. That was good. That was good. Who put the ball in the Brentford net went a, a lot of the weekend. Well, I enjoyed when it, tra- when, it, um, when it morphed from who put the ball in the Brentford net to who put the ball in the Palace net. Yeah. That was quite... And, and there is an element as well of... And it mostly happens at away games, let's be honest. Um, but when there's something particularly witty and relevant and it's uh, like it could only be sung that moment at that game. And when the crowd does come up with a good one, a bit like that, like Harry yeah. Wilson, he's done it again. That's... And and when the whole crowd just takes it and it's that's that they're the, the Wonder Wall at Griffin Park is one of my favourite moments ever. Do you remember that? No. So there was a lad in the Brentford end giving it absolute beans in a full Parker <laughs> sunglasses, <laughs> and when Fulham scored, the entire crowd just sang Wonder Wall at him. <laughs> it was exceptionally good, um, just like just great stuff. Everyone had a good time. Um, that was that was good. I enjoyed that. That was that was a long time back now. It must be a decade ago. Um, but I, I've always enjoyed those kind of ones. That bloke at QPR with the rattle who used to get dogs abuse. Do you remember him? Yeah. He like, used to have a rattle in the home end. You'd be like, God's sake, would that guy shut up? Um, he used to get all sorts of abuse. Yeah, usually. it is quite fun when one particular asshole in the home crowd gets picked on by the away end. I remember being at Wigan and there was just someone who got picked on. Well, he was being a bit of a dick, but he was wearing yellow. And yeah. so that was just the, that was the insult. I was like, who's the wanker in the yellow? That one doesn't even work. It's too many syllables. Yeah. But, but you know, yeah. we are, we are. There was a, there was one at Reading a few years back where someone got picked out and that was enjoyable. Um, who really lost the plot, lost the head and got carried out by security <laughs> just from everyone giving him grief. So that was hugely enjoyable. Um, but yeah, I know I'm with you. I think that can't take my eyes off you. Feels, also it feels quite special. No one else does that. Mm. Like a lot of our songs are, not rip offs, that's the, the wrong word, but like our variations on every things team that other... sings and it's super X, yeah, and yeah. It's super Grimsby, like they all sing it. Like it's and so while it's fun to do the full on one, yeah, can't take my eyes off of you as original. And going back to the original point, that was something relatively nice about Take Me Home. Whilst some clubs sung it, not every club sung it, so I liked it. For, yeah, uh, yeah, for, yeah. for that for that reason i think so yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those there, i mean it feels like things have like calmed down in terms of player chance for a while the oh, wow. well it's, it's interesting because you know the kind of directness of, of where they were and, and look a lot of big names obviously left the club but the harry wilson mitch rich and niskin song that was sort of the soundtrack to the championship winning campaign was incredible. I was just talking earlier about that Ryan Frederick song. That used to go loads. People used to love that song. There's not quite as many of these things for no. a specific. They do level develop player. during the season, don't they? Obviously, like Mooney's got his last year, yeah. which was which was a which was a lot of fun. It takes time um, for, for for them to build. Um, There's a Raúl Jiménez to um, just can't get enough at the moment, which yeah. is starting to trickle around a little bit. But we could do with Raúl scoring to really. You know, kick it off the yes, mark. So, 100%. yeah, a couple of bits. Also, shout out to Marco's one. I really like it. I like. I'm not going to sing it because there's a read word in it, and I don't want Jack to have to tag this as explicit. <laughs> but being able to scream a little bit of abuse at Scott Parker if he's listening, always fun. Oh yes, that one. I thought you meant the one to Glad all over. I was like, is there a bad word in that? That's just uh, we've got Marco Silva, but yeah. yes, no. But the on other contact one. eyes with you very briefly as well. I think like we can all remember and have that audio memory of leaving the cottage after big games when it's playing and just feel like I remember when we beat Chelsea a couple of years ago leaving the cottage to that and just feeling like I'm going to remember this moment for the rest of my life yeah speaking of can't take my eyes off of you um the d there was a dj in the away end at Selhurst Park um I said dj like I was like dj there's a dj um (laughs) like you were a 90s like r&b artist yeah but he uh he spun uh the disco version of can't take my eyes off you just before the game which went down quite nicely he then (laughs) <laughs> he then completely yeah well, that was a, that was that was a high moment for the dj a, a low moment for the dj was playing hit the road jack by ray charles um <laughs> during the minute silence i think he was trying to get people to go from the bar into the ground <laughs> he hadn't realized that there was a minute silence going on <laughs> exceptionally good obviously like 
it was incredibly disrespectful. But um, like, I but don't I'm think, sure the DJ I don't think it was done to. with any. Yeah, it wasn't done with any malice. But like, Palace fans were not happy. I was still outside at this point because the queue for the bar was so long. And you kind of get to that point, you're like, well, I've just this kick off, and I've just been served a pint. Like, what am I going to do here? So, sort of drinking them, and then I kind of realised, and I was like, the music hasn't stopped, and this was definitely their remembrance game. Oh no, <laughs> that's going to upset people. And then you go online, you're like, oh, that really upset people. That I, really and I upset wondered, people. I wondered if maybe because you know we were in the away end, so we were quite close to the DJ. Maybe it was only the away end that hurt. But oh no, I spoke to some Palace fans afterwards. They were in the upper Holmesdale, the other side of the pitch, and they could very much hear "Hit the Road Jack" um, blasting like a bad smell. And when you're a club in crisis, that's the kind of thing just to add onto the list. And like, and the DJ played Hit the Road Jack during our minute <laughs> silence. This club is going to the dogs. Um, so yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's still not as legendary. It's quite as... an amusing choice of song. I know. As well. uh, like... Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. I, it was just there. It's like the juxtaposition of it was horrible. Um, still not as funny as the Nottingham Forest minute silence after the Queen passed. No, um, that, that was that. That's was the still, all. That's the, the all time. The best I've ever seen. It'll never be topped. Mm-hmm. Um, minute silence ruined. Um, the video's online somewhere. Uh, final one, um, and I enjoyed this one from uh, Gersamir says, I listening to Fulhamish for over two years and love the analysis and breakdown of each game. I wanted to ask you why Harrison Reed is not given a chance in the midfield this season. I know he didn't have the best impact against Everton or in the cup games, but surely 90 minutes with our best players around him would be a better litmus test. I think he's our most natural number eight. Um, look at the 22-23 season. He puts very good crosses into the box. Uh, he also has good link-up play on the right-hand side of our attack. Uh, he's also good at playmaking, I feel. Remember the ball through to Harry Wilson for the final goal against West Ham in the 5-0 win. I cannot understand why he is not given a chance, even at 60 minutes for AP in the number eight position. I have heard discussions in the podcast that we lack leaders on the pitch, and he is definitely a leader in our squad. I hope he gets his chance soon. That's thanks from Gersamar. Yeah, I mean, I do appreciate this as an argument, and I and I also very much appreciate that he's referred to there as a number eight, because it's exactly what Harrison Reed is, a very destructive kind of number eight. But you look at the options available and I think that you know in the last couple of games we've either been chasing something and therefore have brought Tom Kearney on in that role and given him the ability to kind of dictate from a deeper position who is obviously club captain as well as everything else or we're in a period where you're like actually we're in a quite comfortable spot here as we were against Palace we have the ability to just kind of raise it and see what we can get and Harry Wilson very much deserved his his opportunity at that moment and we saw like a little shuffle around in the midfield in order to accommodate him in a slightly more central role which worked quite nicely I I thought and obviously he scores a goal but generally you kind of look at where he was and where he was popping up they're the areas I think you really want Harry Wilson in so I feel a little bit sorry for Harrison but equally the opportunities he's been given it's quite hard to take those when you play a role like Harrison. There's one thing, you know, getting five minutes at the end of a game of being Harry Wilson, you can score two goals and suddenly you're back in contention and you're you're yeah. back in the in the mix. And then you come on again and you score and, you know, your name's been thrown around. Th- there's never been a moment where Harrison Reed has come on and scored two goals in five minutes. Like that's just not the nature and of his it's character. Not as easy to even if you did come on, it's hard to well, I mean, you can make a load of good tackles, I guess. But yeah, well, like, as as he's kind of pointed out, like, you can make a good pass. And I, and I agree with a lot of this. I think that Harrison Reed is maybe a little bit of a victim of his own ability to kind of do everything to a decent standard, but nothing to a brilliant standard. Yeah. Like, as, he, as he's kind of pointed out here, yes, he's pretty good at, at starting any occasional through ball through, but for me, not as good as either Pereira or Tom Kearney in that. So therefore, they're both ahead of him. He, his tackle rate is is excellent, but he's not as good as at playing in a deeper role than Sander Berger is or Sasha Lukic has proved to be in, in recent weeks. He can swing a cross in, but ultimately you don't really need that player in this Fulham team swinging crosses in. And we've not had huge success from swinging crosses in anyway because we've had no one on the end of them. So I think that he has plenty of really good skill sets. And I'm really glad that Harrison Reed is still around this squad because he feels like a kind of plug and play player at, at almost any point. But I, I struggle to find out what kind of game state you're throwing him in there that Fulham haven't got a better option either going forward or in a defensive kind of sense to try and shore things up. And, and that's where I think he gets a little bit stuck. I think you kind of a little bit like 
you have the benefit, you have the positives and negatives really of the position you play. Positive being a goalkeeper, you tend to not get, you tend to play a lot. If you're in the squad, you're in the squad. You don't really have to worry about your position too much. Playing on the wing, playing up front, you can get subbed a lot. You can get chopped and changed a lot, but at least there's always that kind of chance of getting back in. It's great when you are the incumbent, but very, very difficult when you're not because there's not a hu- often a huge amount of reason but other injuries or terrible, terrible form for you to get in that squad. Harrison Reed deserves to be playing football. That's the only thing that I think. I think it is a, it is a shame that Harrison Reed isn't playing football, whether that's with Fulham right now. I don't know. And and there's a lot of talk that I think... I think this is going to be Harrison Reed's last season at Fulham. I just get that feeling. Yeah, me too. I think if there's enough... If, if this goes on, unless he gets a miraculous return to the team, I think if you are Harrison Reed, you're saying to Marcus Silva, let me go. Let me go somewhere. Sure. But like, I also wonder then, what would, what would Harrison Reed's next move be? Because... Harrison Reed, and, and this is a fair argument, and I think in response to this, and you can say Harrison Reed deserves a shot, and, and I think that's a fair comment, but would any team who's better than us in the Premier League buy Harrison Reed from us? Not better, but I, I think that, you know, you've seen that, I know they're not exactly the same player, but like the Calvin and Phillips experiment at Ipswich has been a bit of a failure. I bet Harrison Reed could have done a nice, fun job. Oh, no, no, absolutely. But the, what I'm saying is that the Harrison Reed. Would if he was going to leave the club right now, you'd imagine he'd be moving downwards. He's not moving up. No. And therefore, the suggestion that he probably should be starting in this team is probably like, well, if he could only start for a Ipswich or a top-level championship team or a Southampton, who are both, you know, remain as much as they're competitive, remain favourites to go down in this in this area. You're kind of looking at it and going, well, if that's it, is he going to improve the Fulham team by switching into Crystal it? Palace could do with a Harrison Reed. Yeah, but only because their first choice midfield is yeah. injured. Like it, Harrison Reed wouldn't start for a first choice Crystal Palace. He wouldn't start for a first choice Brentford. He wouldn't start for a first choice West Ham. Like my my point is is not that Harrison Reed is a bad player. He's an excellent footballer and he's been a wonderful servant. Yeah, but if the place that they're going is quite far down from where you're trying to get to, the chances are they're therefore not improving your squad by start moving in in place of a starting player. Also, like as you've seen with Crystal Palace, those injury crises add a couple of suspensions in there. So all of a sudden, we are playing Harrison Reed. Oh yeah, it and, won't and take also, much in December. This is it. Like I, I would, and I'd be very happy. Yeah. yeah, there's no, I have no problem or issue with it. And I think Harrison Reed is a wonderful squad player for Fulham. But I, at this point, I think he is a squad player. I don't think he is a player in the starting eleven. Right, Jack, uh, that is all we've got time for Indeed. today. Um, what are you up to? Well, you mentioned you're off to uh, you're off to Ireland. Yeah, I'm going to Ireland. Uh, as people are listening to this, in fact, as this podcast is scheduled, for the moment it releases, I will be up on my way to Heathrow to fly to Dublin to watch us undoubtedly lose to Finland <laughs> tomorrow night. So that'd be exciting. Um, that's what I'm looking forward to next. So. A Timu Puki masterclass. In, at the it just Aviva. stinks of it, doesn't it? It just stinks of Timu Puki scoring a hat trick. So hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully Ireland will win. I haven't seen Ireland win in a long time <laughs> in the flesh. Like So this would be good. It would make me happy. Nice. I'm on a slightly interesting one. I, uh, I have a French aunt who lives in a village called Gap uh, on the foot of the French Alps. Nice. Who, who doesn't speak any English. Uh, she's in her early 90s and has a broken rib Um, and as the only one in my family that can speak even a modicum of French um, we're doing the pilgrimage out to France you're going to Gap we're going to Gap and not to buy anything (laughs) (laughs) very good Um, well that's cool when are you going there I'm going on Sunday coming back uh, Wednesday is it ski season Uh, it's not and can you get up I was going to say could you get up a mountain surely it's getting there it's getting there. It's I don't November. think. Surely you can ski. I don't think there's. Uh, this isn't a ski resort though. Yeah, but you just drive up the Alps. <laughs> if you're at the bottom of the Alps. You may as well go up the Alps. I don't think my ninety-year-old French aunt's gonna. No, be you can leave her at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna. It'll take you one day to do all the catching up you've got in French, and then, oh, then yeah. you can, <laughs> then you can, then off you can go. Right, I'm sorry. I'll see you later. I'm going on a chairlift. Right. Hey, if I can wangle it, I'll definitely do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I mean, I would. Um, does that mean I'm in charge of the Thursday club next week? It does mean Excellent you're in charge of the Thursday stuff. club next week. Uh, expect chaos and fireworks. I'll see who I can drag in onto the sofa with me. <laughs> have a lot of fun. I will do. I will do. Have a nice time in Gap. Thank you. Yeah, enjoy yourself and uh, have a well earned rest from. 
hosting this every week. I, I, I shall do. Uh, for your listening pleasure, though, uh, the Jack and Joe show will be uh, on the podcast feed and on the YouTube uh, between now and the weekend. And then, yeah, we'll be back with the Thursday Club this time next week, looking ahead to Wolves. So uh, thank you very much for listening and watching and uh, have a great weekend, whatever you're up to. You whites. You whites. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.